Last time I sat down with you, you had just sold your company for $3 billion. Um, so I'm hoping to break just as big of news during this interview. <laughs> um, but just to start out, you know, since you sold the company last, you know, since you sold the company, you guys have been integrated with Google, although I know you operate um, pretty separately. You know, what are some of the biggest changes since that sale? Well, for us, really, um, we were able to come to Europe much more quickly, right? One of the big, deal, big parts of the deal was to be able to get infrastructure and, uh, you, you know, not office space, people, legal, all of the various things that we need to be able to open up countries for business. And so we were able to, you know, eight weeks ago, go into uh, four more countries here in Europe, and we hope to roll out into more countries around the world very quickly, because we're in 135 countries. Our products are used in 135 countries where we don't even sell yet. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of work to do, and, and Google has brought a lot of resources to bear to help us with that. What are some of the challenges kind of rolling into a, a new country? You've got a, a lot of different restrictions. It's completely different. So what are some of the challenges as you guys try to do well, that? Well, you know, first you start off with um, the homes. The homes are different, right? In the U.S., many of the homes were just built in the last 20, 30 years. Many of the homes here uh, and around Europe were 80 years, 90 years old, or even older than that. And they also have infrastructure that's different, not just the electricity voltages, but how they're wired, how they're plumbed. And it's different in every single country. It's not like the US where it was much more similar. Um, so each of the products have to be adapted. We have to build installation networks. Right. We have to understand how, these, uh, how the products would work in the home. You know, in the UK, 60% of people don't even know what a thermostat is because they don't even have them. Right. right? And in France, they, they are just now having laws for smoke and CO detectors. So there's all these nuances about how people live, and it's very different. It's not like the mobile environment that was created just 10 years ago or, or 20 years ago, and we can just bond on with the same products worldwide. It's a very, very different thing. And, and is everyone here familiar with Nest, exactly you know, what it is? Raise your hand if you're familiar with Nest. Oh. Wow. So you got Hopefully some you have some customers out there, too. <laughs> so I was going to say, maybe we need to do a quick explainer. I don't think we have to do that uh, in general. But so now, so Google acquired you guys. Uh, and, and at the same time, this was the beginning of quite a bit of Google acquisitions. I mean, at first, I remember everyone saying, why would they acquire a company that does a smart thermostat? But then, of course, they're acquiring robotics companies and all these crazy companies. It, it, was this kind of the beginning of a new strategy for Google? Well, you know, we had some really big talks about this because I was like, so why are you interested in us? You know, I could understand, you know, I said, Larry, I think you have a lot of infrastructure. I think you have a lot of technology, smart people. And I can see what, uh, you know, you can bring to us. What can we bring to you? And, and if you read the FT article, I don't know if any of you did, but I, I suggest you read it. And it's, uh, it, it's, uh, it's all about Larry and the vision for Google beyond the search engine, beyond the ad machine. And it's really about societal change and impacting positive impacts in our environment, both in our home environment, in the community environment, and in our world environment. And uh, he, he really sees you know, where we could go in 10 or 20 years, and he doesn't, he's an impatient person, and he wants to 10x everything and bring the future in as fast as possible. And so through those conversations we had, then I saw a real reason why we, he wanted us to be a part of that vision, because it's, it's not about ads, it's not about search, it's about changing the home environment and changing energy usage in the home and safety in the home these kinds of things. And so that's what really resonated, and it was really a marriage, uh, you know, a, a marriage of mission, not a marriage of money. What was that first conversation like with Larry when, when <laughs> you know, when he kind of was fishing around and kind of wants to buy you guys, and you go in, and you've talked to me the last time I interviewed, you just kind of cite yeah. these crazy conversations you had with Larry Page. So what was that first conversation like when you guys sat down and you first started talking just take me through that. I, I can be Larry Page, you're Tony Fidel, let's do this. <laughs> well, it first started, you know, two, it, two, two and a half years earlier when uh, Sergey and I were at TED together and I showed him the very first nest in a back room. And they, they said, oh, can we buy the company? And I said, no. And they said, well, can we invest? And I said, okay. And then, you know, and then he invested a couple times after that. And then ultimately, you know, and so we already had a dialogue together about what we were doing and they, they knew uh, kind of where our vision was going, but they didn't have a lot of details. But then when we finally said we wanted to raise some more money, they're like, now's the time. Because Larry had the, 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 
the, the cycles to think about these big projects that he wanted to take on. And he was like, this is part of his big strategy. So what is it about Nest? I mean, not all of us have like a, a thermostat in our bag and go into the back of a room with Sergey and, and him, he says, I want to buy this for billions of dollars. I mean, what is it particularly about Nest? Uh, were they buying you? Were they buying the technology? What was it that, that really was so special? Well, I think, you know, Silicon Valley is a small world, right? And I had been in Silicon Valley at that point 20, 24, 23 years. And a lot of the people on our team, they had been trying to hire either from Apple, you know, we brought them to Nest, or they were, they were, they were, we were competing for the same talent. And, and they were trying to pull people out of Nest as well. And they couldn't get anybody out. So they understood the talent we had. They, they saw sort of the mission and how we really dramatically changed the game. Like, Everybody said, thermostat, are you crazy? Thermostat? My wife said, thermostat. And even Larry said it. He's like, you never would believe a thermostat would have ch changed the world the way it did. And so through the vision, through the team, through our experience and the experience management we have, you know, you just heard Danny Reimer talk about uh, t management teams that can scale. We, we were shipping, we shipped, uh, the team that we had together shipped almost a billion products. There's very few teams you can buy who has experience shipping a billion products. Mm -hmm. Right, and all of those things came together to to really, you know, make us. I think what they saw as a valuable asset. So Nest doesn't stop with a thermostat. You guys now have a smart smoke detector. You, let's take a look into the future. I mean, what's next? I know when you walk into your home, wherever in Silicon Valley, you look around, and you say, "Oh, that should be smart. That should be smart." I mean, what's next for you guys? Well, well, first we should talk about where we are today because we have a really important announcement. It was it's something that I've been dreaming of for the last four years since we started the company, which is today we're actually, for our Nest Learning thermostat, announcing with Electric Ireland that you can get free Nest thermostat and free installation for signing up with a, a utility plan for two years with Electric Ireland. So 1.6 million households in Ireland can now get a free Nest for a very low tariff. This is huge. This is just like the cell phone industry. We believed three years ago. Yeah. yeah, it's really great. We're really, really proud of this, this relationship. So think about, we, we always thought it was going to be much more mobile phone driven. You have a service and a carrier, and you have products that bond to that. And this is now the first result of that, that kind of partnership. Electric Ireland sees the vision, and we see it together, and we're working in concert to bring these out to, to, to hopefully many more countries. But this is a seminal event here in, in, in Ireland that we think is going to change the world. Hmm. And, so, and so now that you've done this, I mean, that's obviously a huge deal for the company. You know, can you look and say, these are other products we want to focus on, or is it right now you've just got to really hustle with what you've got? You're not going to launch anything anytime soon. Oh, well, you know, the, the first thing is we can't build everything. We can't take every product in the home and revolutionize it. We need partners, and that's why we have the Works with Nest program. So now we have about 5,000 developers all working on either hardware products or software products or combinations of the both to work together with us. Because we can't, you know, we're, we announced LifeX, a partner who makes smart light bulbs. We have Mercedes Benz with a car. So when you drive home, the, your house warms up or you drive away, your house starts to, uh, you know, save energy. These are the kind of things that we can't build uh, ourselves, we have to use partners. So for us to, to get to, uh, you know, we have Whirlpool with appliances, these kinds of things, we need partners and we hope uh, many of the startups here will think about us and, and think about what they can do with their products and how they might work with uh, our products. And let's talk about, I mean, we, the connected home vision is huge now. So the Internet of Things, we all have heard about this at, at this point. You know, how concerned should we be about the fact that everything in our home is now essentially mm -hmm. or eventually going to be connected to the internet? You know, how concerned should we be about data collection? We should be absolutely be concerned. We should always ask the questions. We should have a dialogue about what's going on with the data. And what, you know, we didn't play out exactly what Larry and I talked about, but one of the big discussions we had was what is going to happen to the data. Because we are invited, Nest products are invited into the home. Just like any guest that you have in your home, you have to trust them before you're going to let them in the door and then actually stay there for a while, right? So it's very critical that we earn that trust. And and through the conversation I had with Larry, it was very clear, Nest will stay Nest, we'll have our own management team, we'll have our own data privacy and security schemes, 
and they're not, the data is not going to flow over to the ad machine, and ads are not going to flow back over to the, to the Nest, and the Nest products. We have a very different business model. So the first thing is having that dialogue like I, we did with Larry, who said specifically, we are not going to do this. Now, it's our job as Nest to earn the trust of country by country, home by home, to show that we uh, are doing the right things for data privacy, data security, and, uh, and keeping our, um, our products uh, you know, really secure. So what could, I mean, there also could be a lot of good that that data could have. I yeah, mean, what, what are some of the, when you and Larry were talking, what were some of the things you were throwing around saying, you know, what do you do with a lot of this data? Well, today, you know, actually yesterday we announced a new software update, which takes our auto schedule feature that learns. So basically when you turn your thermostat up or down at different times, we learn from that. We've taken all the, uh, the data that we've collected over the last three years, and we were able to eke out another 7 to 10% more energy savings, and that's a free software update we're, we're giving to all of our customers to save more energy. That's what we use our data for, is to literally make make our products better. And we've done 30 software updates for our thermostats already. And you know, you worked at Apple before, so now yeah. you're at Google, although Nest, you've said, is, is still separate. Are you seeing, you know, what is, what is the difference in the culture between Apple and Google, now that you've kind of had a foot in both of those worlds? Well, you know, Google is 15 years old or, or so. Uh, Apple is much more on the uh, 30 to 35 years now. And so the cultures were created at very, very different times in history. We didn't have networks uh, at Apple when the Apple was created and the culture was created. Didn't have mobile phones, didn't have any of that stuff. So it was a much more hierarchical structure and the communication structure was very, very um, understood. At Google, it was born out of a network culture. Everyone could just talk to everyone, and they could learn about everything, and there's much more transparency. So just having those two different cultures, I'm not saying one's better than the other, but it's very different that with the very first day when the deal was announced, I got all of these various individuals um, from inside Google saying, oh, congratulations, and I want to work with you, and is there something we can help you with? And, and, and at Apple, it was very structured, like, you're not going to just send us a, a message to Steve for any reason and just say congratulations and flood his email box. It was very, very different. And I, I embrace both, and it's really nice and fresh to have that, that open communications and transparency between, um, between the individuals at the company. And, you know, we've seen a lot of Google in the news lately because Larry Page, his role is shifting a, a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. You know, what, what's your relationship with him? I mean, do you report to Larry? Yes, I report to Larry. So will that change at all? Mm, no. That won't no, change? No. I mean, you know, what, what, will his shift do anything for your role? Well, I, you know, he's going to spend, he's going to have more time to spend with us, and that's great because he knows Google way better than we do. He knows, he knows a lot of it. You know, I'm sure there's a lot of things he doesn't know, but he knows a lot of the interesting technologies. He knows, hey, we have this over here. Maybe we can, we can utilize it here. So I, I'm looking at it as a great resource because I can only learn so fast because we're so busy building the business we're building, but I can only learn the different parts of Google um, so quickly and, and the rest of our team. So I'm, I'm looking forward to spending more time than just the, the few hours we spend a week together and hopefully spend m more like a day a week together. I mean, you guys are such a, a huge part of the hardware push at, at Google. Do you think in the future there will be more of a push even through Nest to, to do more hardware products through Google, not just specifically Nest? Well, you know, before Nest, there was the self-driving car, there's Google Glass, there's all kinds of other hardware projects. So I think we're just a further extension of that and, and, and getting deeper and richer into that area and bringing more expertise in. So, you know, I, time will tell, but absolutely, you know, you can innovate software with great hardware. And remember, they were, and you don't see this, but the server's software, server hardware is so incredible. Like, they build their own servers. You know, we build our own servers now. And, and, and those kinds of things are incredibly powerful to help the, the software evolve much more rapidly. And, uh, and I think that's what's going to happen when you see a connected home with, you know, things on the Google side, the Google brain, and how those might blend together over time, but still staying very safe and secure and private data. So in this article that you're telling folks about, it's a, it is a fascinating article. People should read it. Larry Page admitted that Google's mission statement seemed a little bit outdated. The, the mission statement was uh, to organize the world's information and make it universally ex accessible and useful. So 
he said he was kind of in search of a new mission statement. It's, you know, to be determined. Since you're at Google, if you had to think of a new mission statement, what would you think the mission statement now would wow. be? Wow. <laughs> wow, that's, really? You're going to put me on the spot with that one? Hey. Um, well, let me think. Uh, Really, I think it's gonna. I, I would think it would be a. Uh, it would, you know, it's the the original mission statement was, was very broad and it was very much about information. I think this is gonna be about uh, the next mission statement is gonna really be about societal impact around the world, a positive societal impact to accelerate change, to bring and to get rid of many of the problems that we have today with lack of transparency in government, lack of transparency in how we consume energy and our natural resources. I think you're gonna see much more focus around that and removing drudgery and those kinds of things that are a part of our everyday to make more effective knowledge workers. Mm -hmm. That's what I think that's going to, what you're going to see in that new vision. That wasn't bad, I think. Okay, you know. Well, um, I'll try. <laughs> <laughs> try. Um, <laughs> you know, and I know you're always asked about this, but you did work very closely with uh, Steve Jobs, and you're a very intense person, not in a bad way. You've got to be intense to be a, a leader, right? Steve Jobs was very intense. Yeah, we got to deal a lot of this. Tell me, but did you guys did you guys constantly clash? I mean, obviously he was a mentor. You guys were very close, but what what did you guys clash over? You know, there was always differences of opinion, and uh, I, it was fascinating because when you have that creative tension. That's when the best comes out, you know. Sometimes he'd get frustrated with me and say, stop asking me so many questions. And then I'd get frustrated with him and just say, leave me alone, let me get my work done. And so this was a, but it's a dynamic thing. I would never trade it for the world. But if you in your startups out there are not having that tension in a positive way for a better outcome for the consumer, you know, I see a lot of the startups that I invest in, in those things where management teams come together and they fight about title and who can do media and who can do this and that. And they're not thinking about the customer. They're thinking about themselves. That's when you know there's a problem. But when you know, when you're really talking about the customer and doing the best for them and, and, and really going into those finite details that seem like minutia but are really important, that's when you know if you have a great partnership. And I would, you know, like I said, I'd never trade it for the world. And I'm looking forward and we're already having that, um, Larry and I together. It's great. Is Larry a mentor now? Because I know a lot of the mentors or a lot of the people you really respect and you had that relationship yeah. with, you know, unfortunately have passed away. You know, yeah. you talk about uh, the first person you worked with, you talk about Steve Jobs. I mean, is Larry Page really, is that one of the reasons you wanted to join Google? Yeah, you know, selfishly, and I even said this to Larry, was, look, at the end of the day, I can only push myself so hard. I need somebody else. I, what, what made me the best was the creative tension to push me to be even more than I, than I was. And that's what got me to this point. And I want to continue to have that. And Larry has a very different perspective in terms of technology and how we can bring the future in. And that pushes me to want to do more and more. Because, you know, we all get complacent sometimes. And, you know, when you're, you know, on top of the hill, you need somebody to knock you down. Hopefully it's not a competitor, but somebody who's working with you and to, to, make, a, to make you better. And so it was selfish for me because it was really, to me, a, a kid in a candy store again with that intense pressure to hopefully accelerate the future, bring, bring it in much more quickly. When we talk about you being kind of behind the iPod, what was it like when you were sitting there with Steve and you were telling him about it for the first time? Or you, were, yeah. you were trying to pitch that idea to Steve for the first time. What was his reaction? Well, I had a lot of background, not with Steve himself, but I had a lot of background with, um, uh, with the team that built the Macintosh. So at General Magic in 1991 to 1994, many of you probably never even heard of it, but it was the team that created the Mac, minus Steve, that created the iPhone 20 years a lot sooner. And so, and, 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 and 20 years sooner. So what happened was I heard all of the stories of Steve and what happened on the Mac team and how they would have to hide people in the closet because Steve never liked that person and didn't <laughs> want to use that technology and they were trying to build a story for why they should use this or that. So I heard all of these stories. And so the very first time I needed a pitch to him, I had all these stories in the back of my brain. I'm like, what is going to happen? Is he going to be just flying off the handle? Is it like, you know, because, you know, everybody loves to embellish the stories, right? And so I finally showed up, and uh, we sat down, and it was, he was listening, he was challenging, and it was just a phenomenal meeting. And we walked out, and I was like, 
wow, that's not what I remember. And a lot of people were like, well, he's mellowed a lot in the last 20 years. <laughs> um, but then the other thing is people were like high-fiving going, that's one of the best meetings we ever had because when you're really engaging at that level with him, uh, it was really, really cool. And there were other times when if you screwed up, he took you to task. And, uh, and, and we deserved it, you know, and, uh, but that made you better. And you're the same way as a leader, right? I mean, you hold people you work with to very high standards. Very accountable. Uh, you know, we, we are all passionate about the mission, and we do not want to waste our time. We work so hard, night and day. We, don't, we sacrifice with our families and what have you. And we're there to, to make sure we hit our schedules, to make sure we hit the right quality level for our customers and, and hit the, the high notes for them. And so when we have a team of 15 people in the room brainstorming and somebody doesn't come prepared or they're sitting there embedded on their, you know, their smartphone or what have you, we call it out and go, get your mind in the meeting. Why aren't you prepared? This meeting's costing us $50,000 or $100,000 to have this, and it's pushing out the timeline for, for, for bringing really customer revolution to, uh, to, to the market. And so I just, I have no patience for that because so we're impatient people. When you look at your resume, uh, you've got the iPod, you've got, you worked on the iPhone, now you have Nest selling your company for $3 billion. You've got a lot of good things on your resume. What's not on your resume? What's not on my resume? Uh, let's see. I sold eggs in second grade. I went door to door <laughs> with a little wagon and <laughs> sold eggs to the neighbors. Uh, I started a chip company, uh, a, a, a CPU company in, in college, and we sold that to, to Apple. Uh, we sold the chips to Apple. We were uh, reverse engineering the 65, uh, 6502 and made it run five times faster. And it was just a team of two of us, and we built the whole processor, had it fabricated, and we actually sold them. So those are kind of the odd things you know, I did through my you know, early days before coming to Silicon Valley. So selling eggs to your neighbors, did that prepare you for pitching VCs or working with Steve Jobs or anything? Absolutely. Uh, yeah, I was also a bad accountant because the, uh, I never really carried the right change in second grade with me. For the, so I'd say, oh, thanks for the $20 bill, and I'd just walk down the street. So <laughs> maybe that's a good thing to, you know, that, was, that really helped with VCs. Yes, our value is much higher. Please give me more money, you know, that kind of thing. What area right now, when you look at technology, it, it, we've seen technology disrupt so many huge, uh, you know, education, transportation. What area right now is ripe for disruption? Well, I still think transportation is huge. You know, we're, we're, we're seeing it. Um, we're seeing space travel also, or personal travel being changed. Unfor we had the unfortunate instance last week. But uh, look, transportation is dramatically unfolding and unfolding faster than we thought. Self-driving cars, partially self-driving cars, assisted driving, um, you know, just, you know, between Uber and the other Lyft, uh, you know, Lyft sharing uh, things. So transportation is continuing to evolve and it's very fascinating because I think it's going to affect a lot of, it's the way we transport between home and office and I think it's that connectivity is also going to affect what we do at Nest. Who's going to win, Uber or Lyft? I have, I have, <laughs> I, I, I'm conflicted there. All right, well, we got to wrap, but one more question, just because I know a lot of people here are building out their own company, so I always like to, you know, give you the opportunity, you know, to talk a little bit, just if you could hit on failure. Failure is a huge part yeah. of entrepreneurship. What advice do you have to folks building their own companies? You will fail. Uh, you're going to fail a lot. I, you know, I had many companies and did many things before the iPod, and it was perseverance you know, and learning through that and just continually trying and trying, but really understanding what is wrong, not just with your idea of the product, but what you need to change inside of how you listen to your gut, how you listen to others, because it could be your management style. I was a horrible manager when I went from an individual contributing engineer till I became a first manager. Horrible manager. And it took me about six months to really learn how to do that right just to be a manager. And then it took even more to be a leader and vice versa, and even further from that. So understand you're going to fail. You know, you, when you start to learn to speak, you, when you start to learn to speak, when you started to learn to walk, you failed many times before you could do it right. It's going to happen. And, you know, when we look at something like a, a Snapchat out there or whatever, yes, lightning strikes, but it, it's not the real uh, way that success happens. Most successful entrepreneurs are in their 30s. 
They went to work with their heroes when they were in their 20s. They learned the hard lessons. They went through failure. General Magic that I talked about was a billion dollar failure in 1994. A billion dollars back then. Huge amount of money. And it was with the smartest team that we knew of, right? So just be prepared for it, but understand that is about getting to that, uh, in that next level to actually get to that success. You know, I'm not the youngest fish. Yeah, I'm 45, right? Most people are half my age in the audience, right? And are trying to build these startups. I was there too, and it didn't always work out. Great. Tony Fidel, thank you so much. Great. Thank you, everybody.